Uh, good morning and welcome to the 21st meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. I would ask everyone in the room to ensure that their mobile phones are on silent. While it's acceptable to use mobile devices for social media within the room, please do not take photographs or record proceedings. Um, we've received apologies from Neil Finlay. And the first item on our agenda is subordinate legislation and we have two negative instruments to consider today. The first instrument is Natural Mineral Water, Spring Water and Bottled Drinking Water Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-287. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have not made any comments on the instrument. Um, I invite comments from members. Oh, no comments. Um, then uh, can I ask uh, the committee to agree? Yep, thank you. Um, the second instrument is the National Health Service General Dental Services Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-289. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comments on the instrument. Can I invite any comments from members? No comments. Um, then can I ask the committee to agree? Okay. Um, that's agreed. Thank you. So we move on to agenda item two, um, and it's the first evidence session on um, sport for everyone, phase two. Um, we have around 60 minutes for this session, and I'd like to welcome to the committee Linda MacDonald, Innovation and Learning Manager from the Robertson Trust. Sheila Begby, Director of Domestic Rugby and Interim Head of Women and Girls Rugby, Scottish Rugby. And Andrea Cameron, Head of School of uh, Social and Health Sciences, Abertay University. And Billy Garrett, Director of Sport and Events, Glasgow Life. And we'll move directly to questions. And the first question is from Colin Smith. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning to our, our panel. Can I kick off? Uh, with a question on the issue of participation. Phase one of the, the committee's inquiry found quite a lot of barriers to participation around things like age, gender, um, family commitment, shortage of suitable facilities, etc. C can the panel give us any community-based examples where you've been successful or you've seen it firsthand, success in removing barriers to participation in sport and physical activity? Start. <coughs> we've, um, as the Robertson Trust, taken a person-centred approach to the funding we've put into this area, which essentially means looking at what those barriers are and how we can better enable people from across the population to engage in sport and physical activity. I would point you towards some of the work we've done around our Youth Work and Sport Initiative, which worked with 11 organisations in Scotland to look at how they could better engage hard-to-reach young people in sport. And also Active East, which you may be aware of because it won an award last week at the Scottish Sports Awards, which has worked in the east of Glasgow and looked at how they can better engage hard to reach young people. The other one you may be aware of is a legacy programme, the Physical Activity Fund, which just published its um, assessment of what worked and what didn't last week. All of these things point to similar barriers, as you've identified, but also approaches which might better work to engage people. And those approaches tend to be community development, youth work approaches, ones which look beyond the sport as the core thing and look at what the barriers around about that might be. Uh, we also, um, in terms of Scottish rugby, see that um, the benefits of having specific women and girls development officers to work with young girls in the community is a really positive step for us. We know that there's a huge confidence gap in terms of girls and women participating in sport. Um, so we certainly have, have had a really proactive approach in terms of employing women um, to work as development officers within the region to ensure that we've got positive role models and that we really support girls and women to actively be involved in rugby. I think that um, rugby is quite specific in terms of having women and girls development officers because we're trying to develop a women's sport within a predominantly male environment. So it's really critical for us that we can use all the tools that we can possibly use to really spark that that generation of, of young girls coming through. Um, we have another example of in uh, women's rugby, we're trying to create a specific culture for the women's game. And in the Scottish borders, it's a really strong area for um, rugby, but for, for male rugby. Um, so we were trying to develop the women's game in the borders. And, and 
a lot of the people involved in the women's game were also people that were involved in the men's game and bringing the culture from the men's game into the women and girls game. So we set up um, a, a facilitation group. The, the clubs and the borders had asked us to do that. So we set up a facilitation group to look at how could we actually support the development of the women and girls game in the borders. Um, and we wanted to work with the clubs to create a model that would allow us to build and allow for co collaboration um, so that we could allow women and girls to train and play on a regular basis. Um, we worked with the key stakeholders, um, really getting them to understand how we could actually, if we worked together, achieve this. And we, encur and we encouraged them all to make the commitment to making this happen. Um, we worked to create the compelling story about why we should have women and girls uh, rugby in the borders, borders. And we looked at what the barriers, the challenges, the choices and the influences were. We then looked at creating, how do we actually create the climate to encourage more women and girls to be actively involved in rugby? So we looked at identity. What did the borders want to be known for in terms of the women and girls game? We looked at skills, belief, knowledge, behaviours and environment. We got, we started from the premise of everybody sitting on opposite sides of the room when we actually started the facilitation day. And at the end of the day, everybody was talking and working together and talking about sharing players, etc. Because that was part of the barrier that, you know, if a club had six players and another club had 10 players, they actually couldn't, neither team could field a team. And that's what we wanted to change. Um, so what we've done is we've actually worked with the clubs and the borders and the volunteers and we've created a strategy for women and girls rugby in the borders. Um, we actually created a, a role specifically for a women and girls development officer <coughs> to help us to really try to address that, that whole culture change. And uh, our member staff started last week. So over the next year, we'll review how that has gone and hopefully be able to feed back on some positive messages that we do have women and girls training and playing on a regular basis and that we can develop the structure and the infrastructure for women and girls rugby in the borders. At our own organisation, we're working mainly with students as volunteer workforce, and they're working with um, community groups in, um, in and around Dundee. Now, particularly one of the initiatives we have been working quite heavily with is active schools, and trying to therefore, you'll see in your paper where you had about barriers to participation, one of the barriers was that people have negative experiences of PE at school, and they carry that then into their adult life, and we know that more... Um, more active children are more likely to be more active adults and so therefore if they've had a poorer experience in the school then they're less likely to stick with sport and exercise as they go into their adulthood and so what we're trying to do is give those pupils a positive experience of PE, making it fun, giving them a range of activities and so therefore not just the traditional um, sort of school sort of uh, menu of activities for sport and that's been one of the good things of working with a whole range of students is they come with a great skill set and often types of activities that they've been exposed to that you couldn't normally put on a traditional PE curriculum and so therefore giving the, the pupils the opportunity to try out these different sports and then connect them with community groups hopefully then that they find something by giving them a broader palette of activities not coming from a PE perspective but making it fun and engaging them in that way that that will be something that they'll then take into their adult life. We've also been working with, um, there is a Keep Well project in Dundee um, and it's targeting 45 to 64 year olds who are at, at risk of chronic health problems and again we've been using the students as a volunteer workforce to look at particular initiatives so we've had um, students to, uh, lead Nordic walking groups, put on badminton within the community as well and again as an initiative to try and find a, an active lifestyle that works for those individuals, brings communities together as well. And so, so the one downside sometimes of these things is we don't necessarily look at evaluating them for the longer term, and that's certainly where there's probably more work to be done. Thank you. Um, I, th it, I might argue that there's a clue, in a sense, to um, opportunities for success in the question. Uh, the question when you asked for um, evidence focused on community-based approaches uh, and I think I think there's something in in that um, our view is that um, the chances of addressing the barriers to participation are, are, are greatly increased if you can develop a genuine bottom-up approach um, members of this committee visited uh, drum chapel community sport hub I know um, at the first um, phase of the inquiry uh, and I think at the same awards that, that you mentioned, Drum, Drum Chapel Community Sport Hub also won uh, an award. Um, one of the key strengths of Drum Chapel Community Sport Hub, which we would um, pose, uh, 
shows as an example of best practice is that it's absolutely community driven. Um, it's absolutely owned by the local people. Um, and that has delivered some really, really interesting results in that community, which, which I know the committee are aware of. The great strength of the community sport hub model is that it allows local approaches. There's, there's, there's no one community sport hub which is the same. Uh, although it's a national programme, it, it allows for local variations. Um, and our view is that's been an extremely successful model in Glasgow. Can't speak for anywhere else in the country. There's Drumchapel Community Sport Hub. I also know that members of this committee visited uh, the Easter House Phoenix Community Sport Hub, uh, which again is a slightly different model, but uh, beginning to deliver some of the same results and, and a genuine sense of community ownership. I also think it's important, and, and that was in, in your question, that we understand that there is a range of, of there's a shopping basket of barriers that are stopping people getting involved in physical activity. And we need to be honest about what they are. Some of it is about experiences people have previously had. Some of it's about geographical issues, cultural issues. Some of it is about economic issues. We need to be honest about that. Um, some of it's physical issues. Um, and certainly it's about ensuring that we address in as far as we can all of those issues and not become obsessed with one or two particular barriers but focus across the board and understand from communities which, which of those barriers um, is the most uh, predominant. So certainly from our point of view in terms of a community based approach the community sport hub model which of course is a national model uh, funded through uh, Sport Scotland that that is something which um, potentially um, and certainly has been demonstrating it in Glasgow uh, hold some of the keys to getting people back in, in participation. Touch on how you actually measure um, success when it comes to participation. You, you, there's been examples there about um, age-related participation, also gender-related, but I'm keen to know how you measure um, the socioeconomic background, for example, of people. Do you actually physically measure that when you're carrying out a project, because I think that was one of the issues that came up in phase one, that that maybe wasn't something that people recorded. It's quite easy to, to measure age, it's quite easy to measure gender, but it's not so easy to measure socioeconomic background. So do you measure that? Um, and also, one of the issues that came up in phase one was the fact that, that, that participation levels after a number of initiatives increased, but actually it wasn't clear whether it increased because somebody who was already active instead of doing a class three days a week was doing a class five days a week. So do you measure whether or not people who are inactive are becoming active as a result of the initiatives you're taking? If I can do the first one, which you, you said about the, the deprivation sort of and, and picking up socioeconomic sort of thing, and certainly because we're working with the schools and that's something which is logged, um, and so therefore we're able to pick that data up as to who's been coming along to, to sessions, and so therefore the impact of that we can measure. Um, in relation, because we're working um, heavily with the children, then as I say, that, that's the data that we can examine. Your second part, I'm not able to sort of kind of um, to, to respond because it's not the groups that I work with. Certainly from, um, from our perspective in Glasgow, um, I mean generally I think it is important that when we are making decisions about how we allocate resources, what we focus on, that these decisions are evidence-based in as far as they can be. I think that's a really important principle. Uh, and certainly in Glasgow, given the challenges that, that Glasgow as a city faces, um, we certainly, um, where we can, wish to track the socio-economic profile of, of individuals who are coming through our programmes and we wish to track transfer from inactivity to activity. So certainly they're key priorities for us. Uh, and in terms of our uh, stage one submission, I think the, the information that we, the evidence we submitted at stage one, I think we indicated some of the things that we are <laughs> tracking. Um, so based on, on a whole suite of different approaches and methodologies, uh, we will uh, where possible, try and measure all of that. Um, that includes questionnaires, that includes postcode analysis based on the information that we get from everyone. Uh, and I think, I, think, I think it is possible to, I mean, there's nothing wrong with people becoming more active who might be active already. I think it's important to say that. Um, if people become more active, that's a positive. But you're right, getting people from inactivity into activity in terms of the overall health of the country is much more important uh, and much more difficult. Um, but certainly we have tracked around some of our programmes some really, really impressive results uh, around our Good Move programme, for instance. And also, 
and I know this is slightly controversial because there's different views, we would, in, we would certainly um, say that there has been a genuine legacy from the Commonwealth Games in 2014 in Glasgow. So, you know, we would measure junior membership of sports clubs in the city. That is about people who were, weren't previously involved now being involved. 401% increase. Qualified coaches, volunteers actively working with junior clubs. Uh, massive, massive increases. Um, so I think it is important that we look at a suite of indicators. Again, and not just, so I know that there's a lot of uh, attention paid to the Scottish Household Survey. That's a viable piece of information, but it should, it's one measurement out of a whole suite of different measurements. Uh, it's a very small sample size. Um, so certainly from our point of view, that evidence-based approach is absolutely key. Um, yeah, I think you've hit a nail on the head. It's a lot of the chat that we're involved in just now is how do we move to a more nuanced view of participation? I think in measuring to date, we've tend to have quite a binary view of participation. So you're either meeting the CMO guidelines or you're not. And I think what the evidence tells us is that is, for most people, not a one-step journey. They, if they're inactive, there might be several steps before they get there. So I think if we're looking purely at participation, we need to look at measures that enable us to track along that pathway. And I think there's work going on in that area just now. Um, I think, again, we need to make the distinction between national level and what we're getting through surveys and what we're starting to gather at programme level. So what are the, are the opportunities within areas like active schools, community sports hubs, where we already have levers and we have boots on the ground, as it were, to start to look beyond that top level participation model. At its worst, the participation driven model leads purely to people counting bums on seats and it tells us nothing about who they are how long they're engaging for or what difference we're making for them. And we would advocate an approach to measurement that starts to look at the, those three questions. Who are we engaging with? What difference are we making for them? And how long are they engaging for? If somebody comes once to a taster session, you can get 500 people in a taster session, but I think what we should be interested in is how many of those people then move on to have some level of regular physical activity? And who are they? Are they representative of our communities? <clears throat> So it's also about targeted engagement and at the planning stages, sitting in your communities, in your sports hub or in your active school, thinking about who is our community and is the work we are doing representing them um, and then starting to try and match it to that. So I don't think there's a simple answer, but I know there is work going on in that area to try and give us a more nuanced view of what's happening underneath that top level of participation. Sheila. I would say that um, through our cashback schools of rugby, we are working in areas of, of social deprivation. But I would say also that you know the Scottish government measures around uh, participation are really focusing a lot on getting in, inactive people active. And just <coughs> as in rugby, we're um, of course we're focusing on how we grow the game, but we're also foc focusing on how do we retain the people that are already actively participating in rugby and I think that that's something that the Scottish Government has to address as well. It can't all be focused on getting the inactive active. It needs to be about how do we keep people that are at currently active um, active in the future. Um, can I just, we've only managed to get through two questions and, and it's now 20 past 10 so can I ask perhaps the panel keep their answers a little bit tighter? Um, thanks. Alison. Um, thank you very much convener and, and good morning panel. Um, we've heard, uh, you know, so far this morning about the need to gather our evidence more carefully. We've also heard about how community approaches can succeed when others might have failed. Um, I, I think when we were taking evidence last year and visiting community projects, the two barriers that came up time and time again were cost and time. So I can see that the community offering might help. There's less travel. It's on your doorstep. It's less time consuming and so on. But I just wondered if you could give us a couple of concrete examples of where the community has managed to succeed when other offerings have failed. A local authority offering might not be attracting the people that we're trying to reach. Um, uh, from a Glasgow uh, perspective, I mean, that, just at the very end of your question, um, you, you, you indicated that where community organisations might be having some success, where local authorities um, um, can't reach in a sense. Certainly from our point of view in Glasgow, um, you know, we don't see the be all and end all of people getting involved in physical activity, them, <coughs> them coming through the doors of our facilities. As far as that, that's not our picture, that's not our view. Uh, we do have, we're very fortunate in Glasgow, we do have a significant estate of leisure facilities. Some of them are large scale event venues, but a lot of them are smaller scale, locally based 
facilities. So in Glasgow, uh, no one is ever more than two miles away from, from a Glasgow Life Leisure facility. The average walking distance from anywhere in the city is 18 minutes to a Glasgow Life Leisure facility. However, we appreciate that there's a number, um, for all sorts of reasons, there are people who... Um, you know, who who won't who won't who don't want to go to those facilities, who are who are culturally not not inclined to go to these facilities. So, we work very closely with community organisations, and we we deliver our own programmes in community settings. Um, so I think it's important to point that out. Um, but we don't have facilities everywhere. There's a part of the city um, towards the uh, south, around about Darnley, uh, South Nets Hill. Uh, where we don't have a lot of facilities, and local people have responded to that by creating their own organisation, um, St Angela's, um, St Angela's Participation Centre. It's effectively a community sport hub, but by another name, uh, created by uh, local parents at the local primary schools with the support of, of uh, development staff from within Glasgow Sport. <coughs> Um, have created, uh, and I, may, I, was, I was out there with the Deputy Leader of the Council a few weeks ago on a wet Friday afternoon in Glasgow, and there were 800... Garrett, but I really need short answers. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, St Angela's Participation Centre in Darnley, a real example of community taking ownership and developing things where the local authority <laughs> isn't really present in any significant way. Others? No problem. There are um, examples, a lot of um, the work we do is with sports social enterprises, so places you may have visited like Spartans, but also places like Atlantis and Oban or Broxburn United Sports Club. What I would also offer back to you though is that we find that these things are going to work best actually when there's partnerships between statutory organisations and those organisations in the ground. Again, it's not a one or the other and, and we would encourage always, as is happening in community sports hubs, that local community groups and sports groups engage with and work with their statutory partners where possible. I was going to give an example in Dundee, which is Showcase the Street, which similarly is a charity social enterprise and it draws on a number of, of organisations and where we're trying to connect things together rather than compete for the same groups of people. That's the kind of way I think to go forward. Um, can I support what, what colleagues here have said? But we really think there's a strong case to be made that the best place um, really to inculcate a culture of participation and sport or physical activity is actually in schools because everybody is actually attending school and the benefits that participation in sport can have in terms of creating confident, in, confident individuals, responsible citizens, successful learners and, and effective contributions is massive. Um, thank you all, that was very helpful. One thing that I'd like to explore a bit further, you know, you've spoken about I agree entirely it shouldn't be one or the other, and partnership working is key to this. Uh, one issue that comes up again and again in the cross-party group in sport, I see we have a member joining us today, um, is the lack or the difficulties attaining access to the school estate. Um, you know, we often hear, certainly in parts of the country, that on a, a Friday afternoon when school's out, getting access to that estate is very difficult. Um, I know the Robertson Trust have commented on the cost of access and sometimes there are other difficulties because of the way contracts have been drawn up. Do you think we're missing an opportunity here and what would you like to see us do about that? I can only speak anecdotally from what we hear from people on the ground, but we do regularly hear from organisations applying to us for funding for sports activities that access to the school estate is difficult, either on the grounds of accessibility or cost. Um, I, I don't think we, we've not done enough work around it to know why, but I would highlight it to you that, yes, it certainly is an issue. And I'm not sure I have an answer to your question, though, in terms of what we can do about it. But again, I go back to the partnership model in the sense that there are already organisations who are in there who can more easily access the school estate than are there things that we could be doing to work with them. But there are groups who won't go across the school estate because they have negative associations with schools as such. And so therefore hosting things within a school estate will already be a barrier just because of the association they have with schools and authorities, etc. <laughs> Uh, it's important not to be complacent. Um, in, in Glasgow, there's a significant school estate recently modernised, um, uh, and and there are challenges around the rationale, rationally controlling that estate in terms of uh, managing access to that. Um, so I think it is important that we're that we're not complacent. Uh, but I know that some of the community sport hubs in Glasgow, in, including Drumchapel. Um, are significant users of the school estate in the city. Um, so I think there are ways to overcome that. I think it is about building partnerships between the school community and what's happening around the school. I think that's important. 
Sorry, Tom, you wanted to come in a specific... Yes, yeah, just a very specific supplementary to a remark made by Billy Garrett in answer to Alison's first question. Um, you used the expression, culturally not inclined to use facilities. Just for the record, could you unpack and define that for me, please? No, you're quite right to ask that. So, um, for some individuals, the um, a large leisure facility... A, a, a kind of palace of sport conjures up the wrong images for them. It conjures up images of of ultra fit people in spandex, uh, and and for a lot of people, uh, they're absolutely put off by that. They prefer something much more low key, something much more local, so something much more community focused. Uh, we've certainly found that a lot of people prefer the corner shop as opposed to the supermarket. Um, so, in response to that kind of threshold anxiety. Um, we have developed a range of programmes which we take out to community settings, church halls, community facilities, parks, so we operate park lives along with a number of other cities in the UK, um, to go where people are much more comfortable being, uh, where families are much more comfortable being. So that's what I was referring to. Thanks. Good morning to the panel. <clears throat> My question actually dovetails beautifully into Tom Arthur's supplementary there, and it's a, another barrier. Um, when we went to the Muir House Millennium Centre in my constituency as part of the visit in the first stage of this inquiry, one particular barrier identified by people there was not the availability or the price of the sport or physical activity um, available to them, more the fact that they were embarrassed about taking part. They were embarrassed in their own body shape, um, the being embarrassed about being made to look a fool. Um, and that ties into, I think, a, a wider issue about body image and what you defined in terms of the, the palaces of sport with ultra-fit people and that I just won't fit in and I'll, I'm so far down the track. Yet those are the people we most need to target. How does the panel think we can break that particular barrier down around body image, around... The, that embarrassment factor and encourage those people who need it most into sporting activities. I think I think the the context is important. Um, so so how we so we have created specific programmes to try and target the most inactive in the city, uh, and we've talked about those with this committee previously. So the Good Move programme, which is an aggregation of programmes that we run in partnership with health boards, housing associations, Macmillan Cancer Relief all focused on the most inactive, those furthest away from activity. So we contextualise that by operating it in community context. The marketing looks and feels completely different from you know, our Glasgow Club gym membership marketing. Uh, we market in different channels, so we're in bingo halls, we're in uh, budget supermarkets, we're in very different settings. So we construct everything around the programmes entirely differently. Uh, it's a, it's the, the path into that programme, the referral route, is through highly trained counsellors. So every conversation uh, is, is constructed in such a way as to, as to try and remove those barriers and to deal with those anxieties that people have. So I think it's about what you wrap around the programme. At its essence, it's a physical activity programme, very low, 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 low uh, intensity, but it's about what you wrap around that, how you market it, how you articulate it, how you present it. Um, I think that we're really... Um Rugby is unique in that it's a, a game for all shapes and sizes. It doesn't matter what shape or size you are. There's a, a space for you in rugby. And I think it's um, also about, and I presume that we're talking predominantly about f females. I, I think it's about just allowing people to wear what they want to wear to, to feel comfortable within the training environments within the clubs um, and making sure that we're not kind of, you know, having people in tight fitting tops or whatever. So it's, it's a degree of choice in terms of, yeah, people feeling comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things is obviously having a range of options for people and they say a range of venues where these things go, but also if you've got people who are leading the sessions who don't look like, you know, we said about spandex being the thing which can be the off-putting sort of side of it, and so they are the role models, and so they, if they can epitomise a range of sh shapes, sizes, cultures, whichever else that are involved, so if we can grow those leaders um, who then take on those activities, use the connections that we have, say, with health services, if they're the individuals that are going to be referring on, but look at the breadth of activities that are there as options, things which are community things. It could just be gardening projects through, you know, uh, joining people together. So there's lots of things where, again, it comes back to what already exists and where can we hook people into existing things or where there aren't, but our community is telling us that they need something, then where are the opportunities 
Yeah, just one final question, Gavina. Um, I've asked two separate panels in the earlier stages of this inquiry as to whether they felt a culture of elitism still exists in um, sport, non-professional sport. Um, that you know, stems from everything in terms of peer selection of who's good at football and who isn't in primary school and that just becoming the received wisdom as to who gets the coaching support and encouraged up the ranks to um, a, a range of other sporting disciplines where elitism can exist. Uh, some uh, pro professional bodies or governing bodies would absolutely argue that they've stamped that out but then user groups came back and told us, no, it absolutely still does exist. So I'd just be very keen to hear from each of the panel members whether they thought there was still a challenge of that kind of perceived elitism within amateur sport. At a policy and strategic level, we have a set of drivers which focus on participation and progression in, in sport. So the signals that are getting sent from the top down and within the system for sport that we currently have focus on those two things. Um, we would say those things are important, but participation is only a driver to us as a nation reaching the goals that we want to achieve through sport and physical activity, which is healthier, happier um, individuals and communities. So I think the opportunity at a strategic level is for us to, s to reframe the lens on that messaging and to really make the connection about how we want to use sport and physical activity in our society. And yes, some of that is about progression and medals, and that's brilliant, but there is a whole wider range of things that sport and physical activity can support us to do, and I don't think we make that message strongly or clearly enough at a strategic and political level. I think you've you picked up on a key thing in terms of how do we balance the recreational versus the, the performance and the you know that side of the participation and keep those people who've enjoyed the recreational in the in the sport and how do we ensure that there's enough either facilities or you say um, coaching support etc for those and I think that will always be a challenge but one of the good things that certainly I see emerging is some of the clubs you know, sports clubs starting to redress that through community projects that they're doing and so particularly you know things like walking football uh, you know going back and, and getting people to re-engage their mental health and football projects again trying to use something where people have got a connection from their past which they've got enjoyable memories with and they're using that then to sort of work with communities and get them back into sport for the health and well-being aspects of it so I said there are a number of projects which are beginning to emerge like that which I think are you know wholly positive. Um, Glasgow Sport is an organisation which of course spans that whole spectrum we're involved in the elite end of performance sport but we're also uh, engaged in the in the attempt to create a culture of physical activity in Glasgow. I have to say that over the last um, three to four years, our emphasis has been gradually shifting with less focus on the elite and performance end. We're looking to Sports Scotland governing bodies and sports clubs to take more, to carry more of the, the load on that one. And we, uh, much more of our focus is on physical activity and getting the most disengaged engaged. But I think, it, I think it's always a mistake to see, and I, I agree with my colleague Andrea, it's a mistake to see those as somehow two adversarial concepts. We've certainly seen in Glasgow some real benefits on the participation and physical activity side from hosting, for instance, international sporting events. Gymnastics is a real success story nationally, but also in Glasgow. Uh, we've hosted an international Grand Prix, we've hosted the World Championships and the Commonwealth Games, and we're hosting the European Championships next year. That has helped to generate, you know, fantastically successful gymnastics clubs in the city. A lot of young people in Glasgow are now involved in gymnastics. The demographics of those involved in gymnastics, to go back to your question, is very, very interesting. It's much more from lower socioeconomic quintiles than some other sports. So that's really, really important. And that demonstration and inspiration factor that elite sport can give you is having an impact at the other end, delivering that culture of physical activity and getting people more active. Um, as, a, as a governing body, uh, we realise that the elite end of the game is the part of the game that is really the shop window for our sport and it's, it's really the game that's a driver and encourages people to to come into the game um, and it also generates the revenue that we can then reinvest back into the grassroots side of the game. So it's really important for us and we don't look at one or the other. We invest in a, a network of development officers that are out there in the community working with schools and working with clubs to try to get more young girls and more boys active in the game and that's certainly a way that we'll continue to work. So um, the, the, the grassroots side of the game is really important to us. Thank you for that. No, I don't for a minute suggest that we shouldn't have elitism in sport and that it does drive uh, inspiration 
and uh, money, as you rightly say, and competitiveness. Um, it's more that kind of the way that percolates right down to entry level to the point where elitism can be a barrier that if you're not perceived as being good on the first day of tryouts, then that's it for you. And I, and I guess I, I just wanted to know how do we how far do we still have to go in stopping that? Because I'm 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 absolutely certain seeing it in my own um, kids football club it exists at primary level. Um, and how do we how do we mitigate that so that we foster that drive for success and that higher high end performance stuff, but not you know starve people out at the very beginning just because they're not necessarily good on a particular day comes down to also the coaches and the teachers that are leading the sessions to make sure that that, that kind of thing doesn't happen and that, that we're actually involving everybody um, within the the sessions that we're doing or within the games that we're doing and making sure that, that young people have game time, um, equal game time within the game as well. I think, it's, I, think, I think there's work to be done. I think there still is. Um, none of us can afford to be turning anyone off from getting involved in physical activity at any stage. Um, and I think, I think now, I think all sports and all governing bodies and all sports clubs absolutely understand that. Or, well, maybe not. I think the vast majority do. And, and that direction of travel, I think, is absolutely established and, and isn't about to change. So, so I, think, I think it is an improving picture. But I, I think there is still work to be done. I think you're right. I mean, I think I remember the experience of my own kids when they didn't make it to the first team. Um, you know, they were devastated. And, and we just can't afford to do that. So whilst not everyone can be in the first 11, what is the exit strategy? What is the, you know, what is, what's constructed around that process to make sure that everyone can continue to be meaningfully involved in sports that they love? Because we can't afford to turn anyone off. And it's having the capacity to do that in the sense of what are the alternatives? Are there enough pitches to put those individuals who've not made it then? Is there, are there enough coaches to support them? And also, what, as you say, are the messages that are coming through from the coaches in terms of the value that they're getting from the sport? Thanks. Brian. Mira, good morning, panel. Just to go back to, uh, I think, an earlier point that was alluded to, um, I wonder if you think that there's a link between a lack of sort of early years access to physical education activity and perhaps a reluctance uh, to engage uh, within certain demographics uh, sort of later in life. Sorry. Well, I mean, one of the things I um, had put in our response was that it, it, we're trying to obviously work with the children and, you see, and to give them positive experiences so that then they become the active adults. Now, one of the things we have tried to do is that when recognising and working with active schools and looking at who are their user groups, where do they have less problems getting volunteer, they, they rely on a volunteer workforce, so who are they, you know, there are some uh, communities where they're more likely to get parent volunteers who are more willing and understand the, the, the value of all of these things, where there are communities where they will struggle to get those volunteers. And so we've worked to try and then skew and redress that balance and put our students into the into the areas <coughs> where they struggle. So they therefore, um, and you'll see from some of our statistics where we've had some very positive results in terms of working with particular school groups which have got higher enrolments from the SIMD to, um, 15 quintile and sort of and then looking at sorry, SIMD 20 Quinta, looking at that particular group, trying to target and offer more opportunities for them to engage so that, they, again, going back to that, if they've had a positive experience earlier on, then hopefully they'll continue to re-engage with those activities as they go through schooling, and also then to think about more targeted opportunities when they go into the, the secondary school sector where they know there's the drop-off. I think early years affords us a great opportunity not just to engage young children in physical activity, but also their families. Um, and I would say that is one of the areas there is room to develop and to do more work. There's already a lot of work goes on in this area within play. Um, and also you would see a lot of kind of walking groups with mums and toddlers. And I think that's something for us to build on. Um, and I think there is room for sports, sports clubs and sports social enterprises, a lot of whom are already doing this, to build on it, but also to talk better about what works and the evidence they're getting out of that. I think another thing is, you'll know this from being out and about, a lot of this is happening on the ground, but we don't often get to hear about it and we don't often get the evidence out of what works so we can start to replicate that in other spaces. I think... Um I mean, we all know that there's a, there is a link between a whole series of, you know, civic disengagement, lower levels of activity, lower levels of participation. There's a link between that and socioeconomic profiles. I mean, we can see that. Um, and that, that is a challenge that, that, that we all face, which is why I think that um, there's a requirement for universal mainstream programmes, which we deliver. 
but there's a there's there's a cha- there's a an absolute obligation to create a series of targeted programs which focus on specific issues. So that specific issue, um, and it's back to comments made by my colleagues. Um, we have created a series of programs in Glasgow, one of which, for instance, is called We Play, which is designed to tackle exactly that issue. So it's about getting. It's an early intervention programme in the same way as there are a whole suite of these across other um, services as well. And that's about creating, and I, and I use the phrase, and I, I don't apologise for using it, I use the phrase culture of physical activity. And I think that's really important because it, it's, it's to get back to that point, it's not just about the children, it's about the parents, it's about communities, but it's also about the, the wraparound services, so it's about safe routes to school, it's about, you know, it's a whole series of issues. Um, which can bedevil communities, um, which are barriers to people getting involved. So is it about a pure experience at school? Is it about a whole series of other things? In a sense, in a sense, it doesn't really matter. We, we know where the issues are. We know where the challenges are. So what we need to do is create a suite of programmes which, which, and interventions which can address that. Um, so we know about, we, we, we can all see the link. It's, it's about what we do about it, really. Yeah. I think, following on from that, what I'm really trying to get to is this idea that the, that the most effective way of this sort of physical literacy, if you like, intervention would really be early years at school, where we have a captive audience and where they have this, you know, uh, ability to deliver free physical education, laying that sort of life skills that allows them then to move on. Uh, later in life into an, an active lifestyle. That's kind of really where I was trying to get to. I've put some data in the in the our response where we we've been involved in the active movers program. Our students have been delivering that for active schools, and that's targeted at primary ones to threes, and to show the number of pupils that certainly were involved in that. And I know from the qualitative commentary that we got back from the pupils about the fun that they've had, the teachers have appreciated the program that's been offered, and so we're hopeful. Whilst obviously it will be a longer time before we get to see what the impact necessarily of that has been, but we you know. Uh, we hope that through those positive experiences, but plus giving them the early building blocks of run, jumping and throwing, that that gives them the literacy to then move into other sports. I, just really to uh, agree with you, Brian, and reiterate the point that I made earlier on, that we very much see school as being a place where we do have a, a captive audience, that we can really inculcate that whole um, area of um, physical activity and sport in young people. And to develop that for later life, because you know, if, if they if they are active in sport in their early years, then and it's a good experience, and it's more likely that they will continue to participate. But it's also about getting clubs and governing bodies to actually work to develop links into schools, in order that we can create these pathways for young people to um, continue to to develop and to, to continue to enjoy sport and physical activity as well. Could I could I ask a specific? Great question to, uh, to Andrea around that intervention at sort of primary one, two, and three. Is, is there any uh, evidence gathering around uh, effects on behaviour and attainment? Um, we haven't uh, particularly done that because I say the nature of the project. That, but there is evidence out there, sort of you know, and, t- and certainly if you look at the Daily Mile sort of project, which has been running in a number of schools, that again there's kind of certainly evidence coming back of better behaviour when the, sh- the pupils come back into class um, and, there, and uh, certainly there is literature around which says that in terms of enhanced attainment um, with, re- with regards to sort of uh, say the, the, the additional benefits that come with these. There's also projects which have been running um, in relation to maths and football sort of types of projects where they're using maths particularly as a tool um, in order to, as I say, uh, sort of using football as a tool to try and educate the pupils um, around about maths. Um, and within our own institution, we're supporting the Dundee Academy of Sport project, which again is looking particularly at sport as a context for learning, where again we're looking at, at attainment. Now, we don't gather the attainment aspects of it, but the data that we get back from the schools is positive and certainly some feedback we've had from one of the, our partner schools, St Paul's in Dundee, they've said that they've got a higher proportion of pupils now going into further education as a, and they believe that that's partly through the work that we've been doing in, in terms of uh, raising aspirations and raising attainment. Jane, if I can give you very good advice, the panel 
Uh, just as a, a follow-up question to, to Brian Whittle, um, he won't be surprised, obviously, given my background as a teacher, and I should also state for the record that I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary for Education. Um, I'd like to kind of pick up on one of your points, Andrea, about these negative associations with regard to PE. And, and Sheila, uh, you also mentioned that school is where the, the greatest impact can be achieved in terms of you know health and well-being and getting kids involved in the first place, as, as Brian was saying. Um, I wonder, therefore, if from your experiences, you think there's an inequity uh, across the board in terms of secondary education with regard to what subject specialisms are delivered in school. So in my experience, it was always dependent upon the secondary teacher specialism. So whether or not the hockey club ran was dependent upon whether that was the, the sport of choice for the, the PE teacher or somebody else. I, I took hockey myself on, on occasion. Um, but, you know, it does depend, in my experience, on the secondary teacher's specialisms as to whether or not these clubs run. So if you want, you know, take up for, from kids later in life, um, you need to get them involved at an earlier age. And if there is no rugby specialist in the school, you're not going to get that take up. Is there an issue then in terms of equity across the board in secondary schools? Are we delivering, you know, sport for all in every secondary school or is it unequal? I think you're quite right in terms of, I mean, it's difficult to take those barriers away because people will always come with their, their specialist area, therefore they'll have that enthusiasm and therefore then that's what they will, you know, they'll be able to offer. And that's where you are dependent on then to br offer broader um, sort of aspects is who else can you bring in? Sheila's already said about, you know, linking with, with clubs and getting clubs to come in. So are there partnerships that could be evolved there? I've talked quite a bit about volunteer workforces. We're lucky because we have a, a very big... Um, sports student population within our institution so where there are connections there our students need the employability skills and that's why we've worked with a number of organisations across our local authorities to try and ensure that they can give them the opportunities they need volunteers but our students need skills and so for you can work in partnership now because we draw students from uh, uh, you know across Scotland and into the, sort of the rest of the UK and a few international students then they bring their expert experiences and expertise and if you get the opportunity to put that back into the school curriculum then I think that's only to the benefit of the pupils but we know that you know again it comes back to what's the estate as well as its access and opportunities ultimately and and that's been there for a long long time in terms of uh, you know what the experiences people will get through the school system um, <clears throat> this is where I also have to come out and say that I was a former teacher as well a physical education teacher um, and do understand what you're saying in terms of you know, the expertise and the specialism and the interest of PE staff within schools. And that's going to, you know, if you were a footballer or a rugby player or whatever, that's the team that you took at school. And it's maybe a big part of the curriculum within the school as well. Um, I was also a teacher who went out into prime, the local primary schools. And I think that we really missed that whole bit of, you know, developing the physical literacy skills within our young people of, you know, the running, the jumping, the balance, all the sort of coordination stuff that just in terms of life skills that we need people to be able to have, but also in terms of sport that we're seeing quite often young people coming through into sport that don't actually, you know, they can't throw and catch or they, they don't have good balance or coordination. Um, so I think it's a big gap for us. And certainly, you know, these kind of things are being addressed through our rugby clubs in terms of their mini and midi sections where they're bringing young kids into the club to develop these physical literacy skills. Um. One of the key tasks of the Active School Network and the Active Schools officers is to address that, that very issue, in a sense. Um, because you're right, within a secondary school environment, the, the, there can only be so many you know, PE teachers with, with a range of specialisms. Um, but Active Schools officers are there developing the links between the school community and the local sports networks, so sports clubs, voluntary organisations, third sector. To, to utilise the experience and the skills and the opportunities, therefore, in the community around the school. Um, so I think it's important that that, that we that we recognise that the Active Schools Network is there to do and ensure that that, you know, I know that within Glasgow we are measuring that very, very carefully, the number of school-to-club links that are developed, how meaningful those are and, and how those are operating. And I think that's really, really important because you're right, otherwise, unless you do that, then you'll always be limited to what's available within the school community, which is always going to be quite challenging. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and um, thank you, panel, for coming along today. I think um, since we're short in time, I will probably um, focus in on a couple of specific issues. And uh, as you know, Sheila, I have a real passion for rugby. Um, the, my inability to be an elite athlete didn't put me off at all getting involved in this game. And I play for the parliamentary team. 
Um, one of the uh, sort of lingering perceptions about rugby, for example, is that it is a sport for wealthy people, certainly here in Edinburgh. Um, and I just wondered, although you're doing, you, you, in your written submission, you documented some brilliant stuff that you're doing to target women and LGBTI community, people with learning disabilities and autism, and the geography, so I know that you're doing great work up in the Highlands, but is there anything specific that you're doing to target that perception that that, that sport is for a certain um, level of wealth? Yeah, I mean, certainly um, through the conferences that we're delivering, um, I would say the majority of, of schools that we're actually working with are, are state schools. Um, so really trying to move away from that sort of private school focus for, for Scottish rugby. So, I, and, and I would say out in our clubs as well, you know, we've got a widespread of clubs that are working within various areas of Scotland and where the, you know, the population, it's not a kind of... Um, elite sport or a sport for, for money, for people with, with, <coughs> with money. So we are targeting, we are going into areas of deprivation. We are working with state schools. Um, so I, I would say that it's it's maybe just a myth as opposed to a fact. I, well, I will be living proof of that. <laughs> um, can I ask specifically about the news today? Um, again, it's in the news about uh, the possibility of rugby causing injuries, so young people playing rugby leading to potential for dementia later on in life. And this is a story that keeps on coming, and it's a broader issue for all sports, I would say, in that there is, whilst most people, myself included, acknowledge that there is a, a real danger to being inactive, there is also sometimes a perception that sport can lead to injuries and can, you know, cause some harm. Um, I, I guess I will ask you specifically, Sheila, first, because the story today in the press was about rugby, but it's a, it's a broader question for all of you as well. Um, I would, I, just as you said, I would say that every sport carries a, a degree of physical risk, um, but we really believe the health and social benefits to young people in being active and enjoying sport are far greater. And actually there are, as you say, more risks to, through people being inactive than, than actually playing rugby. Um, we would say quite categorically that rugby is a safe sport. And I don't know if any of you saw the Scotsman editorial today that talked about we mustn't uh, confuse elite sport with the thrilling game that's inspired children for over a century. Um, I would say at Scottish Rugby, we're absolutely committed to player welfare at, at all levels of the game. And our Rugby Right, uh, which is an online training programme, is mandatory for all coaches, teachers and referees who are required each season to complete the course to ensure players enjoy the game in a safe and informed environment. Um, I would say concussion awareness has been mandatory for more than seven years and Scottish Rugby did great work um, in terms of leading the whole area of if in doubt, sit them out, which was actually signed up to by all the governing bodies and supported through the Scottish Government as well. Um, the course modules in terms of rugby right include player welfare, safe coaching and safe contact techniques and are completed by four and a half thousand coaches, referees, etc. per annum. Um, I would also say that we do, we are very taking very seriously player welfare because we un undertake research in partnership with the Scottish Committee of Orthopaedic and Trauma Surgeons. Um, it's called the Scott Group. And they've helped us to implement physical maturity assessments on players. So we do take seriously player welfare and we're working with key practitioners and renowned practice practitioners throughout the world. The can I just, Sorry to, can I just to add one last little bit? Very briefly, because I've got two other committee members who want to ask questions and we've got less than five minutes. Yeah, OK, I'll just be one sec. So we're actually working this year on Rugby Activate, which has been um, some research delivered through the University of Bath and the RFU, which is the English Rugby Union. And it's a, a warm-up, and it's shown to reduce the number of injuries in rugby by 70%. So we're actually working on that this year to deliver that as part of Rugby Okay. Uh, Miles, you wanted to come in on... Thank you, yep. um, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I was wanting to ask a question regarding future sustainability around facilities and services, especially around future funding. And I know um, <laughs> there's discussions around the Barclay Review and non-domestic rates at the minute. And part of that was the removal of rates exemptions for charitable <laughs> bodies, sports clubs and arm's length organisations such as Glasgow Life. And I wondered if the panel had any views on that. And again, you need to be extremely brief... 
can start. Um, certainly, we welcome Glasgow Life welcome the announcement that the Scottish Government will seek further uh, engagement with arm's length uh, extended organisations, um, and certainly we would welcome that. Um, uh, understanding, I'll be very brief. Understanding the background entirely of the review, uh, we think, however. Um, that uh, there is a real danger that decisions could be taken which would have some significant unintended consequences on the very matters that this committee is discussing in terms of participation, access to physical activity. Um, Glasgow Life uh, operates uh, a service which is not comparable to anything that's happening in the private sector. We're a not-for-profit organisation. Um, delivering services in parts of the city that the private sector simply wouldn't and delivering services that the private sector simply wouldn't deliver. Um, so making any kind of equity comparison we think is, is, uh, is, is inaccurate. So certainly we, we certainly welcome further discussion and we are, we'll be certainly making representations on that basis. Today, my question was um, in general terms round about um, how resources kind of trickle down through all the different organisations that are involved in sport to get to where they make the most difference. And in particular, um, we talked earlier about the impact on hard to reach socioeconomic groups in terms of participation in sport. Um, and I suppose it, it's really a question directed at, at uh, Mr. Garrett round about um, you talking your submission about Phoenix and Easter House, which is an organisation I'm familiar with. Um, so I suppose the question is, to what extent do you think the money trickles down to where it needs to get to? And a follow-up to that, how much, you're talking in glowing terms about Phoenix, how much money are you, Glasgow Life putting into Phoenix and Easter House at the moment? Uh, to start with the end of that question, sorry, I, I don't know, but I've got to be honest. Uh, certainly, uh, absolutely, thanks. certainly. Um, but I suspect that most of the support we've given to the Phoenix Community Sport Hub has been around officers working with them to help create it and, and build participation, etc. Glasgow Life's not a, a, a grant awarding body as, as such. Um, but in terms of the wider question, um, I think I think you're right. I think there's a real challenge there. Um, I think um, certainly from our point of view, and it's part of the shift in emphasis that I mentioned earlier, much more looking at working with the most disengaged and the most inactive. And what we have had to accept is that in order to do that properly, uh, there are agencies and organisations out there who are much better placed to do that than we might be, who are much closer to those communities, much closer to those client groups and those target groups that we want to work with than we are. So we are, and, and, th and that's a challenge for us, we are looking at and examining a range of ways in which we can, if you like, devolve that further down to, as you describe it, to the place where it can make the most difference. Uh, and, and actually, we think we've got some successes in doing that. Um, there's, there's never enough money for... So when you talk to Richard McShane, of course he wants more resources, he wants more support, and, and that's absolutely legitimate. Um, but I think, I think we are beginning to see in Glasgow one or two examples. I've mentioned some of them already, Drumchapel, um, St Angela's, where actually, given the challenging financial landscape, because there's no point pretending that, you know, that there's a lot of money uh, around, um, it's about how we work smarter, how we utilise existing networks that are out there, as opposed to maybe the old school where, well, we know best, we'll just roll out and deliver it. Certainly we're moving away from that. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Because, yeah, I mean, to my understanding, they don't get any support at all. And as you're rightly saying, you're talking glowing terms about the work they're doing. Obviously, as a committee, we visited that. Um, and uh, apologies for talking very specifically locally, but it's, it's what I know, and I believe it'd be not dissimilar in many other parts of the city and the country, um, with very limited support and really struggling against a lot of barriers, but delivering very much on the ground. So I'm glad to see you recognise that. Um, there are other organisations, I mean, next door there's the Phoenix, uh, there's the Gladiator Weightlifting Club, which has got youngsters out winning medals at the moment on the international stage, again, to my knowledge, with very little, if any, support through official channels. So I'm glad you're taking that on board, and yeah, if you can have a look at are, that and get back to These are organisations we know well. We're very, and uh, very interested. Sorry, perhaps Mr Garrett could uh, uh, supply us with some written information about what great. support yeah. Glasgow yeah. Life is Happy putting to. into um, sport facilities um, in Glasgow, and particularly in, in your constituency. Thank you very much. Mr Mickey. I'd like to thank the panel very much for coming along this morning, and we'll suspend briefly to change witnesses.
the second item on the agenda is an evidence session on NHS staff governance with the Cabinet Secretary. I am, I'd like to welcome to the committee Shona Robison, a Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, Paul Gray, Director General Health and Social Care and Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, and Shirley Rogers, Director of Health Workforce and Strategic Change Scottish Government. And I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Yeah, thanks, uh, convener. I welcome this opportunity to, to give evidence. Uh, staff governance is a, a key part of the governance framework in ensuring that NHS Scotland is an, an exemplar employer and its diverse workforce is treated and managed well. In 2014, a, a monitoring framework was agreed in partnership with our trade unions, with boards responsible for the implementation of the staff governance standard at local level. Boards are also held accountable through a national return and annual review process. This is about continuous improvement. We are currently reviewing our approach to ensure that assurance mechanisms are driving any necessary improvements. We have around 160,000 staff and we need to listen to them as it's the workforce who are at the heart of everything that we do. They are our greatest asset. We need to value, support and motivate them to do the best job that they can. And we need to lead by example. Our values are important by demonstrating and recognising these. Our staff feel valued for the great work that they do. And we see this on a day-to-day -day basis throughout the NHS. One of our key achievements has been a, a transformed approach to staff experience through the iMatter programme. iMatter is a, a continuous improvement tool to measure and improve staff experience developed by our staff for our staff iMatter has been independently validated and it measures staff experience against the staff governance standard. Evidence shows that staff who feel valued and engaged provide better health and care. We've gone from a context of poor levels of engagement. As you're aware, staff surveys had response rates of around 35%. The current iMatter response rate is over 60% with an employee engagement index score above 70%. The programme rollout is nearing completion and iMatter is engaging individuals and teams in the decisions that affect them. This includes 23 out of the 31 health and social care partnerships who are now using this approach across integrated teams. That means that the programme now involves over 170,000 staff. Figures are indicative at this stage, but it shows real progress. The full national report will be published in February next year, supplemented by the results of the Autumn Dignity at Work survey. We're also taking action on pay. We recognise that at a time of rising inflation, a public sector pay cap becomes increasingly unsustainable, which is why we've announced it will take account of rising living costs and setting pay for 2018-19, and why we're working in partnership with, with the trade unions to commission work to develop an evidence base that will help assess the impact of pay restraint and can be used in the next round of submission to the independent NHS pay review bodies. The committee has heard a lot of evidence on experiences of raising concerns. Concerns are often raised and resolved locally and informally, but where that doesn't work, staff need to have the confidence that they'll be supported, listened to and responded to. In recent years with our trade union partners, we've developed a single national policy, local named policy contacts, non-exec whistleblowing champions, an independent whistleblowing alert and advice service, and we've introduced a presumption against confidentiality clauses and settlement agreements. We're committed to adding to the roots already in place for raising concerns, and we aim to ensure that everyone has a choice about how they do this and an external route to escalate concerns if they're not resolved. We're establishing an independent national whistleblowing officer. The INWO will provide external review where individuals have a legitimate concern about the handling of a whistleblowing case. This is a further step in developing an open and transparent reporting culture in our NHS. The INWO will complement our approach to whistleblowing and provide independent challenge and oversight and should have the powers and functions to do so. We're in discussions with the SPSO with a view to the uh, SPSO hosting the role by the end of 2018 and I received written consent yesterday from the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body for legislation to be introduced and I'll announce more details to Parliament in the coming weeks. We have to listen to concerns when raised and value where they give us an opportunity uh, to change. We're clear that it's essential to have honest, open and transparent culture within our NHS and we're making good progress but there's still more work to be done. Happy to take any questions. The Cabinet Secretary for uh, that opening um, statement. Can I ask, um, are you satisfied with staff governance in the NHS? I think we have um, very uh, well developed staff governance arrangements. Uh, they are developed 
uh, and have been developed in partnership. The partnership arrangements we have in the NHS are um, are looked on with some envy, I have to say, from other organisations. Uh, but we mustn't be complacent, and partnership requires uh, effort on both sides to uh, to make sure it delivers. Um, and our staff governance arrangements have evolved uh, over the years. So you know, I think we're we have good staff governance arrangements. I'm not complacent. There's always improvements that can be made, and I think the some of the areas I've laid out today show that you know we are always looking to um, ensure that we we make further progress. And can I ask on the, on the back of that then if you're satisfied with the progress that's been made um, towards the staff governance standard since monitoring began in, in 2006 with the staff survey? Yeah, well, I can ask Shirley to come in some of the detail, but I think the I matter development shows that that's an important tool in um, continually getting that feedback from staff um, at a, a rate and a level that has improved from previously. I think the rates of return uh, previously were quite low. I think staff, the staff feedback was that they didn't feel it was a tool that worked for them. So the I matter was very much developed in um, collaboration with the, the staff side and the unions and has, uh, I think, shown um, uh, itself to be very much rooted in being developed uh, by staff, for staff, and I think that will bode well in terms of the returns that we get from that. But you know, it's, it's something again we need to keep under review as we, as I matter, uh, um, is, is taken forward. Do you want to say anything? So I've worked for the NHS for the last twenty-two years. Um, I recall the introduction of the staff governance standards when I was working in a board, and I think those five standards taken as a package have moved the agenda forward quite considerably. They uh, set a, a benchmark for how um, the relationship between management, trade unions and staff work across NHS Scotland. They are achieved through a number of means. Some of those means are formal means around partnership working, engagement with the staff side, a whole raft of those kinds of things. But they also set a tone for the industrial relations and employee engagement within NHS Scotland. It's, it's not perfect. Um, we, we know that there is more that we need to do to make sure that when staff raise concerns, the first reaction, the first response they get from leaders within boards is not always as great as we would wish it to be. So we're spending a lot of time looking also at our leadership management development arrangements across the NHS. We've worked very closely with the staff side to make sure that those five standards of staff governance are achieved as frequently as it's possible to do, and the survey results, the staff governance audit results, have shown a considerable improvement over the 10, 15 years history of, of their introduction. There's more to be done. Um, Alison. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good morning. The 2015 NHS staff survey showed that 41% of staff wouldn't recommend the, their workplace as a good place to work. Um, the highest levels of satisfaction were amongst executive grades and senior management, where satisfaction was at 75%, um, but that dipped to 29% from ambulance staff. Do you think that will have changed now? Are these results illustrative of pressures on the NHS? And why do you think there's such a difference between the ambulance staff and the executive staff? Uh, I um, took the, the annual review for the Scottish Ambulance Service this year, and part of that annual review is, is a good deal of engagement with the staff side and the, and the trade unions. And I think although there are still challenges, I mean, the ambulance service um, has changed uh, beyond recognition over the last few years, uh, but it is a very physically demanding role. It can be very stressful. Uh, and sometimes uh, um, due to uh, you know, pressures, I absolutely uh, understand uh, some of the, the concerns raised there. However, there have been a number of developments, the new clinical response model, uh, the rebanding issue. I think although one thing I think has led to a, um, has, has resolved a, a long-standing issue. 
um, and the clearer pathways now for ambulance staff in terms of their uh, employment opportunities um, to to move through from a technician to, to paramedic and the new, new specialist roles. Uh, I came away from the annual review very heartened that um, there are there's been a number of developments and actually the um, the morale was was um, was improving and that things were in a much better place. But still a lot of work to be done. Um, and in some ways, maybe the ambulance service is perhaps a good kind of litmus test of of how things are progressing. So uh, I think you're right to highlight the ambulance service. It is the area that it, you know, the most work needs to be done, but I was very, very heartened by what I heard um, at the annual review. On another topic, um, the issue of whistleblowing champions, we discussed that last week at some length, and um, Paul Gray <laughs> in a letter suggested that the role would be best suited to a non-executive director of each board staff governance committee. Now, that has raised concerns um, in written submissions and from individuals that I've spoken to, and I'm sure others have had the same experience. Why does the Cabinet Secretary wish non-executive directors to be whistleblowing champions? Do you share any concern about a potential conflict of interest? I understand it, but the idea was to have a leadership um, within boards that was non-executive um, so that it was a, a, a step removed from those with executive responsibility and the idea being that they would drive and champion uh, the whole um, area of, uh, of, of trust, of being able to uh, speak out and of whistleblowing uh, policies. Now, um, I, I still think that's the, the right thing to do, but it's not the only thing. It is one element of an, a range of measures that have been taken to try to change culture and provide a clear way of, of staff being able to raise concerns in addition to the, the helpline and, of course, the, um, the uh, independent and national uh, whistleblowing officer. So it is one element, and it's probably fair to say it's maybe been working better in some boards than others, and I think we need to perhaps take some lessons from that. Um, but there have been some very proactive non-execs who have gone around very uh, much uh, around the uh, the wards and the, the, the areas within um, our uh, NHS, uh, speaking to staff directly and promoting that, that culture. Um, Paul, do you want to? Sure. <clears throat> um, I suppose it might help if I gave a couple of, of examples. So in, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the whistleblowing champion asked the board to upgrade the level of investigation as they felt that um, in the specific circumstances it was appropriate to do so and that was done. And again in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the, the whistleblowing champion was not satisfied that a case had been investigated properly and asked that it be reinvestigated. In Lothian, the whistleblowing champion was asked indirectly to become involved in an in individual case, but the internal processes hadn't been exhausted, so they ensured that they were. And they also ensured that the board took on all appropriate actions and received written updates on this and all other live cases on a monthly basis. I have a number of further examples, but in view of time, can share them if, if, if the uh, committee would wish. So I, I think we have evidence that the whistleblowing champions are being proactive and are making a difference. And I think it is important, as the Cabinet Secretary says, to set them in the context of the other avenues that staff have to raise their concerns, whether through their line managers, whether through ultimately the employee director who also sits on the board um, through public concern at work. So the whistleblowing champion is, is a component, but not a panacea. And I think the, the fact that we are proceeding, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, with the um, establishment of an independent national whistleblowing officer, which of course the Parliament will have the opportunity to consider, um, is evidence that we're continuing to, to, to build on what we already have in this area. Is this an area, though, that the Cabinet Secretary would keep under review if it, beco if it becomes apparent that this individual is not independent or impartial enough, or simply that perception will never be that this one step removed is still a step too close to you know, being actively involved in other aspects of a board's governance? 
Yeah, I mean, play, you know, be assured I, I keep everything under review and absolutely will uh, keep that under review and perhaps look at learning from the best practice of where it's worked well and does have the confidence of staff and where there are issues in other boards where perhaps that's not uh, as as strongly the case. So um, it, I, I don't see anything wrong with it in principle. I think, though, it's the execution of it and making sure that the, um, the, the person, as the, some of the cases that... Paul Gray highlighted is shown to actually be um, driving improvement um, and, and benefiting the, the system. So, uh, yes, in, in short, of course, um, happy and happy to you know, uh, come back to, to the committee at a later stage um, if you know, uh, developments are, are uh, taken forward. Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, and Thanks, panel, um, for coming along. The, I was going to ask a question about best practice, sharing a best practice, but it was just interesting to follow up um, very quickly on uh, Alison Johnson's comment. Myself and the deputy convener uh, actually visited the ambulance control centre in Glasgow during, during the recess, uh, to some extent on the back of the results we'd seen and who we went in were expecting, um, I think it's fair to say, problems. Um, but we did have quite a, a good chat with management. We were very open. We spoke with the union representatives and we spent quite a bit of time talking with the staff in the call centre. And frankly, it was quite uh, different to what we'd expected, much more positive environment. So to some extent, perhaps the survey did its job in terms of highlighting a problem that was then uh, that was then dealt with. Um, my specific question was, was round about, as I said, sharing of best practice. Um, and you kind of touched on it, there will be health boards or parts of the NHS in Scotland that are maybe not best practice, but certainly better practice in the area of staff governance. And I, I just wonder what mechanisms are in place to identify that and then to share best practice and facilitate that between the different health boards. We attempt to and are driving more and more um, um, within the NHS to take a, an approach that says if, if there's a best practice in one area that works well, then there has to be a pretty good reason why that's not happening everywhere and to, and to hold boards to, to account for, uh, for making sure that they take forward that best practice in whatever uh, area that is and, and, and not least in the area of staff governance. So. Uh, so the, the good practice that's been highlighted in some of those cases, we would want to make sure that um, boards could see the benefit um, of, of um, having that culture and having non-execs in the role of champions who actually do affect change. Shirley? There, there are some formal and informal ways in which we have an understanding about best practice around staff governance. So my... Um, team are uh, working very close contact with the boards. I'm from a board myself. I, I work very closely with our trade union partners as well and with staff and spend quite a lot of time out and about in, in the service. In, indeed, coming back to your ambulance example, I'm, I'm pleased that you've seen that evolution. The, the ambulance services is, is, is different in, in some categories to, to the rest of the health service. It has 150 locations across Scotland. And one of the issues that the ambulance service wrestles with, and I, I can say this having worked in the ambulance service for a number of years, is leadership visibility in being able to get out into those small pockets that are largely around ambulance crews or the control rooms. Um, but coming back to your, the specifics of your question, we have some formal mechanisms. So I meet with the HR directors of the boards every month. We meet with our trade union partners regularly. We meet with the employee directors and we meet with the whistleblowing champions formally to share good practice. Mm -hmm. But we also have a number of informal means to be able to share that stuff. So, for example, one of the um, whistleblowing champions has started to blog and we found it's actually a whistleblowing champion in Dumfries and Galloway. And they found, surprise, surprise, people have started to see that as a less formal means of communicating. And it's be benefiting that system. So being able to share that kind of good practice, formally or informally, is something that we do. And of course, we still have a particular interest in anything where there is a, a potential for dispute. So when we've got issues of concern that are raised, or indeed as... As, as a previous question told us some stats that make us look at something with a bit more detail, then we have some formal interventions that we can bring to bear there and ask boards to give particular consideration to a particular strategy around something. Thanks, Ivan. It mails. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, I wondered if you could outline to the committee your role as a prescribed person within the Public Interest Disclosure Act 98. I think it's the Cabinet Secretary specifically. Um, as prescribed person within the Act. 
Yes, <clears throat> and I would suggest, uh, Mr Briggs, that we should write to the committee about that, because given that it's a legal provision within the Act, we've actually just had to answer some questions about that recently, and we did get some substantive uh, briefing on the matter, and I think it would be more straightforward if we wrote to the committee and described that, um, because, <clears throat> as I say, it's, it is a technical legal matter, um, and uh, it would be better if the committee had the... the uh, formal advice on that, I think. Is there a particular concern you have with that? The questioning was around the suspension of members of NHS staff, right. and I think, especially when they escalate a complaint to one of the prescribed people, including yourself, <laughs> um, you know, how many people have you met yeah. to discuss these concerns? And then specifically, whether or not you think it's effective for someone to be, when there's a non-medical complaint suspended, um, and then maybe not return to work within the NHS? So. I mean, let me answer that carefully because obviously these issues are very complex, sensitive, and I'm not, you know, it would be wrong of me to discuss individual cases, but I have met with uh, individuals who have asked to meet me, many of whom have been through, as you can imagine, a very, very long process. Um, and what you find uh, is, as you wouldn't be surprised to hear, that there is a very complex a set of relationships that have got the person to the position they have, whether that's in relationship to their management team or actually, in some cases, other colleagues. Um, and um, and you know, I always make it very clear that my uh, powers of intervention uh, in these cases are very limited because it's uh, really an employee-employer matter. Uh, but um, you know, in those particular cases, I thought it would be helpful for me to hear the concerns being raised by the person. But it is a very tricky territory for me as Cabinet Secretary because um, I think, as you would accept, it would be wrong of me uh, to um, uh, necessarily intervene in a process that has had a very long, complicated route uh, that is an employee-employer relationship. Uh, and it is, you know and very sensitive issues quite quite often. So I tread very carefully. I take very uh, um, careful advice before meeting someone. But, you know, on certain occasions I have for, for, for particular reasons. Um, but it would be wrong to obviously share the, the specific detail of those. Sure. And I think this is where the committee, when we've been doing our work in this area, have found that for some members of NHF staff who have gone through the complaints procedures, and have actually reached a point where they can't then um, go back to their work, um, there's real difficulties. And actually, in a non-medical complaint case, retaining these people, I think, is something we, we need to try to look at reforming. Well, I can think, and again, I'm not going to get into the specifics because it would be wrong to do so, but I can think of at least one example where uh, the person worked, ended up working in another board after you know, a very difficult, long um, uh, process within the, a, a particular board um, and they were uh, redeployed if you like and I think you, you make an important point when where possible you don't want to lose uh, those skills um, and you know sometimes when you boil it down it's down to a, a breakdown of relationships uh, either with a colleague or with a, a line manager or or uh, and and you know things are never black and white either. You usually find that they're very much in the grey area of 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 responsibility for. It. So I I mean I think we would always take the point of view that um, and we would expect management uh, within boards to take the point of view that the last thing you want to do is lose those skills. Um, and if the person wants to remain working in the NHS, which sometimes they don't, let's let's be honest about that. Uh, but where they do, then I think uh, efforts are made to try to find a, a resolution, as I can think of in uh, at least one one case. Do you want me to, if there's do, any uh, the relationship that we have with the management of the boards is also to be taken into account in this respect, and there are uh, numerous occasions where I will intervene to ask the management of a board to give a particular attention to something, or if there's a matter that I think has not been appropriately resolved, then I'll intervene to make sure that they are as best as is possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can, can I just ask here, isn't it wholly a matter for um, employees and employers, um, and can the Cabinet, the, the Cabinet Secretary would intervene in patient safety issues and force an investigation if it's out with an employee issue? Uh, 
Uh, well, I mean, I would have expected before it gets anywhere near me that, that that would have already happened if there are patient safety concerns. There are very clear uh, way, um, procedures for investigation. Um, I mean, I think the, the, I think the culture um, within the NHS should be one of, and the duty of candour that's being introduced next year is really important and pertinent to this, should be that, that staff feel able to um, give an honest and open account of what has happened when something has gone wrong. That's really important. Um, now, there may be ultimately disciplinary issues or registration issues in terms of the regulators if something is found to have been so absolutely um, uh, um, wrong in terms of the person's capability and, and actions and, and culpability. But often it's not as straightforward as that and it tends to be more around um, you know the, the the best the best judgment call at the time, and so you know I think we ha you'd have to separate out what the issues are. Um, but we would expect before anything came anywhere near me, I would certainly expect that all the processes and procedures to have um, been gone through and adverse event reviews carried out. And obviously, there's been a, a fair bit of attention uh, given to that over recent months, and, and quite rightly so. Um, so. Um, when I, when anything comes to me, it's usually at the end of a long process that has gone before. And can I ask just, just very briefly on that, and, and would an employee be able to access support throughout that process, say from a trade union or from another supportive element of the organisation? Yes, uh, and it's very important that when something has gone wrong, and that can be a very... Uh, a, a very stressful time for the, the the staff member who could be well you know often and most often be very distraught about something that that has gone wrong in the, the terms of patient safety so it is very important that the staff member is supported and again there's very clear procedures for that and through a, uh, you know when it's a when it's a significant adverse event review that again it's important that um, that, that staff members are supported and that it's in the atmosphere of, of a case of, of learning from what has happened and training and change from what has happened and it's a you know if if then you're into different territory around disciplinary matters or indeed around registration that is a, a different sphere but the processes are very clearly uh, laid out it's also the case that anybody suspended from the NHS should have, through their HR department, somebody allocated to be their contact person who can provide that kind of support, yeah. whether or not they're a member of a trade union or a professionally regulated body <laughs> or not. Thank you. Uh, Alex. Thank you, Good, Good morning to the panel. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask about the National Confidential Whistleblowing Helpline. Um, I've asked the Cabinet Secretary about this before in the Chamber and in this committee. Um, I was struck very recently when a constituent came to see me um, about concerns they had within the NHS. They were a member of staff and, uh, and I mentioned this to them. They were unaware of it um, and then expressed a degree of disbelief in, in what might happen if they phoned it, a lack of confidence that it would be taken seriously or acted upon. Can you give us an idea of how um, how that's improving, if it is, in terms of uh, call volume, how those calls are being dealt with, and what kind of feedback people who make calls to that um, helpline receive in respect of the complaints or concerns that they've raised? Okay. Um, well, since its establishment in 2013, the, the line has received uh, 309 calls from staff, which suggests that there is a demand for the service. It is always room for improvement and I would be concerned if if staff didn't know about the helpline because it's pretty well advertised everywhere but you know I'd be happy to look at the specifics and if there's more in that particular locality it needs to be done to um, promote the service then certainly we would make sure that that, that happens. Um, I mean, obviously, the, quite often the encouragement, given what we've just been talking about, about trying to resolve things before they escalate um, and have a, a kind of early intervention. So um, 
Often the encouragement would be for the person to raise their concern with their employer in the first instance, as it gives the employer then a chance to respond to those uh, concerns. Um, and if the individual isn't comfortable in doing so, of course, the um, the uh, the uh, public concern at work uh, uh, staff, people who are legally trained advisors, they can do that on behalf of the the, the person. Um, uh, if if the person feels very uncomfortable about doing so, um, so I mean I I would hope that given it's now in its fourth year of operation, um, that people would have confidence that it's a, a very professional service, um, a wealth of advice, and pretty good feedback from those who have used it. But again, as I've said in answer to previous questions, there's always room for improvement. And particularly, I am concerned but, uh, that there's that people, if you're saying that that uh, some staff members don't know of its existence or how to access it, and that's something we would take very seriously and look to do something about. As you mentioned, the 309 calls, and you might not have this information in front of you, but um, what is the profile of that in terms of, is that a glut at the start when it was first launched, or is that just sort of a, cre a creeping incremental uptick? Or I think it's been pretty consistent. Um, Shirley, have you got the... the I, I haven't got the precise figures, though. I can give you those. But in the, in the first year of its operations, the calls largely fell into three categories. Um, the first category being calls from other parts of the UK, Second category being a number of people who are ringing to see whether or not it was actually there, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting. And um, and then finally, the calls from NHS Scotland itself, and thereafter, the, the numbers have been quite high, uh, but quite consistent. Can I come back to the point that you were raising about communications? Because I think that's very important, and there are two specifics that I wanted to, to draw the committee's attention to. The first is... Um, We've had a, a stall for public concern at work at the NHS event for the past several years. So we've had the opportunity for people to have dialogue and put a face to something, as well as the poster campaigns and other things that the Cabinet Secretary has already drawn reference to. That has put a human face on, on it, and people um, seem to respond well to the opportunity to be, go, to be able to go and ask people what's going to happen if they raise a concern or what, whatever that might be. The other, the other thing is I think it's really important for credibility to be able to, to tell some stories appropriately anonymised of what happened when people did raise concerns. Mm -hmm. So we know that there have been issues that have been raised through public concern at work where action has been taken and it's important for people to have confidence that that is the case. So I, I know of uh, uh, at least... Um, a couple of instances where people have drawn concerns around a particular clinical service which has resulted in further investigation, further work, and indeed in some remedial action in, in one case in particular. Mm -hmm. So we're working with public concern at work to try and find a way to anonymise those stories appropriately but put them out into the, into the NHS domain so that people can see that it's not just a, a pointless exercise and that actually things happen as a result most of the people who raise concerns through the line are raising concerns because they want something to be fixed rather than just because they want to have a, a moan about something. So it's important that those things are fixed. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Midi. Um, I wonder if I could ask specifically about the duty of candour. So um, I'm a member of a regulated profession myself. I'm a pharmacist regulated by the General Pharmaceutical Council. And I already have a duty of candour, so I wonder what um, is going to be added by the duty of candour that comes in next year, in April. I, I think the, the, the duty of candour will add a, uh, an, uh, an attempt and driver to uh, change culture. So it will explicitly say that by law um, there is a, a, a duty uh, on uh, on staff members, uh, members of NHS, um, to uh, give a full and, and frank and honest account of um, uh, anything that is uh, of concern. So, I guess it is part of a, a basket of measures to to drive that cultural change. Of you know, there is a perception, rightly or wrongly. Um, 
and I hear this sometimes from patients who are making complaints that sometimes they feel that the, the barriers go up when something happens and that there's um, that an attempt to, you know, to, to kind of circle the wagons. And, um, and I don't think that is always the case, but I can see why that is a perception. The duty of candor really says, uh, as an organisation, there is a duty on everyone to be honest and open and an expectation and a legal requirement. So it adds that kind of sharpness and sharp point to it so that no one should then feel that they have to be part of a, you know, a, a, a circling the wagons because they're on a legal duty not to be. So if it, it provides a, an incentive uh, it's for cultural change, but also protection, really, that everybody is under duty to, to give an honest and frank account. So, uh, you know, it, it's not, it's a part of a drive uh, to, to improve um, culture within the NHS. It's not the only solution, but I think it brings with it a, a kind of sharp point um, that um, will be very clear of what the expectations are. And you know, we will need to monitor the implementation, make sure that we see um, the duty of candour actually leading to more transparency and openness in, in the way that uh, the NHS operates. Thank you. And a slightly or tenuously related topic would be um, the question of regulating um, managerial professionals. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the, um, I think it was the BMA submission, suggested that it might be um, a good idea to have regulation of management in the same way as there's regulation of the professions, and then there would be a, a parity there. I wonder what your thoughts are on that issue. Mm. Um, have you got any thoughts on that, Shirley, in terms of whether it, it, it's not, obviously there's not a clinical, there wouldn't be a clinical regulator, so it would be more around the performance, which I guess is the performance management is done within the NHS in terms of, uh, of, of management's performance rather than by a regulator, but it's an interesting concept. It's, it's, a, it's a question that has been raised um, for the past 20 years, probably, and, and um, one of the, the things, of course, that the duty of candour brings is a, a requirement on everybody, whether they're in a regulated profession or not. And I think that's very important that many of the responses that go out managerially from boards are not about, you know, they're beyond where the clinical process has taken us. So they might be in the resolution of a financial claim or in a whole range of other things. So there's a there's a there's a point to be made there. I think the approach that's been taken so far has been about making sure that we make appointments that comply with the kind of standards that we expect to see in public life, with the kind of um, cultural and values-based recruitment that we are uh, increasingly moving towards that gives us a cadre of managers that are... Um, so I, I, to say as a, an NHS manager myself, I think the, the professionalism and standards is good, but but it is something that we continue to wrestle with and we'll continue to, as we develop that professional management leadership cadre, I have no doubt we'll come back to that question again. And of course there are a number of clinical managers as well, so managers who come from the clinical community who will obviously still be regulated, and I think that clinical leadership is really, really important. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I suppose it was only to comment that if you are a <clears throat> practising lawyer or accountant or quantity surveyor in the NHS, then you are regulated by your own professional body. Um, but, I, I mean, I would go so far as to say I, I would welcome uh, any proposals around the, the regulation of um, managers and leaders in the NHS, because I think it would bring parity. Um, we'd have to think about both the risks and the opportunities. But I certainly wouldn't fear it. So, uh, I, I, you know, I would be quite the opposite. I would welcome it. And if there were if there were sensible propositions that could be taken forward, I would be very happy with that. Um, thank you, and give you a good morning, panel. I think in gathering evidence uh, around uh, governance, it's uh, there's, there's certainly a growing perception that there's a disconnect between uh, frontline NHS staff and NHS managers. And I wonder if that's something that you're aware of uh, and what you would be doing to try and combat that and break down those barriers. Yes, I, I suspect in, in every workplace um, you will uh, always get um, a, a feeling where um, 
some workplaces are better connected and there, there's more of a um, a positive feeling towards managers and in other settings uh, less so I think where you have good leadership and um, whether that's the senior charge nurse or an award or whether it's a member of the senior management team where that leadership is good it's then respected by staff might not always agree but I think it's, it's respected um, and uh, and likewise I think where you have strong partnership arrangements managers um, find that a, a, an easier environment in which to operate because there are clear uh, and good uh, strong partnership arrangements where concerns and problems can be resolved in a spirit of partnership. I think where there's difficulties is where that's maybe not as strong um, and where perhaps relationships have, have broken down. So um, I I don't think it, it characterises the whole of the NHS, but I think there are areas, as an organisation the size of the NHS, there are undoubtedly uh, areas uh, where um, staff management relationships are not as good as they need to be. It's then what is done about that, and there is a responsibility on both uh, uh, to try to improve partnership arrangements to make sure that uh, issues of concern can be worked through, and that uh, concerns that staff raise are being listened to and addressed. And it's a, um, it's a mixed picture in an organisation this size, as you would imagine. Well, and, and a very tenuous link uh, in terms of around the NHS being um, a positive place to work. I think there's, there's a concern around the health of our healthcare professionals. And given that uh, our healthcare professionals are the frontline staff who are giving health uh, advice. Um, the, the the idea that uh, the NHS currently, especially among um, I think uh, nurses, frontline nurses and midwives, is not a place that's in, uh, conducive to having a, you know, a healthy, active lifestyle. Um, is, there, uh, is that something again that you, you're aware of? And uh, what can we do uh, to to make it a better place uh, in terms of health and well-being? I, I think you touch on an important point. I think whether it's the um, physical health and well-being or mental uh, uh, well-being, I think both are, are equally important. And you know, our NHS and care staff work very hard, sometimes in very stressful situations, and therefore the, the occupational health support around uh, the system is, is very important. And a lot of effort has been put into intervene early um, to make sure that uh, um, there are um, clearer pathways. So, for example, if someone who is uh, working in a very physically demanding job reaches a certain age, it's important that that's planned for and you know whether that's lighter duties or a different role is anticipated and um, well in advance. And I think there are parts of the service are getting better at that because we want to hold on to staff. We don't want to lose staff through, um, you know, Ill, Ill health, re retiral before, before their time if they can give further years of service. So we need to get better at that. Um, in terms of the general health of our... Um, our health service staff, there is, um, um, you know, a, 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 um, some kind of well-documented uh, um, regular surveys that show that there's work to be done there and that, they, you know, we need to lead uh, by example. The, the chief nursing officer, I think, I'm, I'm not going to embarrass her here, but I think she has done a lot around the system in terms of the nursing uh, staff and, and uh, you know, the need for... Uh, for uh, to, to lead by example, but the system needs to support people, both their physical health and their mental health, and I think it is getting better at doing that and recognising that early intervention is, is best. Thank you. And can I just ask the, the, the panel one final question? Um, you'll be aware that we've taken lots of evidence from integrated joint boards and, and looked at uh, not just health, but also social care staff. So to ask whether or not there are any plans um, to have a, a single governance standard for health and social care staff. So um, I'll let Shirley say a little bit more about this uh, in a second. I uh, think that there is potential there. I know that a number of IGBs have already uh, taken the, 
the, the staff go governance principles of the NHS. Uh, I think there was a view at the start that um, and there was sensitivities about it not seeing uh, one system imposing their way of doing things on another. But it's fair to say that the staff and, and unions uh, within uh, local authorities and within the care sector quite like the NHS staff governance uh, aspects of it. So we have seen a, a gradual um, uh, adoption of some of the, the staff governance principles uh, across uh, the IGBs. And I think that's probably a direction of travel we'll see more of. You're probably closer to the detail. Thank you. Um, so the committee may be aware that the NHS um, Scotland Workforce Strategy, Everyone Matters, was something which was launched in um, uh, about five years ago now um, and was a, a health and NHS Scotland specific document. The next iteration of that we've already started to work on with colleagues from across the health and social care platform. So from a strategic intent, we will have everyone matters for the NHS in Scotland, but we will also have some of the principles of that being considered across that wider health and social care um, agenda. agenda. And, and indeed, the Everyone Matters Implementation Group has representation from people across the wider boundaries than the NHS in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary has already pointed to the success of iMatter being considered as, a, as an appropriate tool for, for the, the wider... Um, implementation and indeed is, ben is benefiting and, and generating good results where it's used in, in integrated joint boards because iMatter is an OD based product so it allows people to work together rather than just fill out a survey or just fill out some questions. It's about how people work together and it's generating some good um, good results in, in that respect. Um, the, 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 the fundamental issue in IJB land has been around um, making sure that the standards of staff governance which apply to the NHS in Scotland are not diminished in that in that space. So whilst we're content that the people have got different arrangements at this stage, as they would do in bringing those kinds of organisations together, people employed by the NHS in Scotland continue to have the rights in terms and conditions of, NHS work, of the NHS workforce. And actually that's been the most persuasive tool of all, because people are sitting next to each other working together and seeing what somebody else has got and thinking i like that okay. um, we will the health service will need to learn from that because there are things from the local authorities and third sector that would be useful and important to engage with for the nhs but fundamentally if the staff governance standards that have been achieved in the nhs in scotland are the best thing then that's that's something that we would want to be able to share across the piece Thank you. Um, can I thank the panel for um, coming along this morning? Um, and we'll now move into private session as previously agreed. Thank you.